Okay, let's do this thing. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. We're gonna be going over the way to read a setup sheet. I don't know if this video is going to be particularly helpful to everyone, but I hope it will be helpful to some of you, especially those of you who've never really looked at a setup sheet before, or you've looked at one and you've gone, oh my goodness, there's so many things in here. I don't know where to start. Hopefully this will help you. But before we do, I'm actually really excited because I've never done any sort of like sponsor or anything on the channel, but today we're gonna do one that is specifically related to RC. It's very new, I'm very excited about it. It is this, the RC Box Club. They went ahead and sent me their first, I, I'm pretty sure it's their first box that they've done. I have not opened this thing, it is sealed shut and I have no idea what's inside. So we're gonna open it together and see what we're in for. Check this bad boy out. Oh, very nice. Looks like a little care package going on so far from what I can see. So let's see, first item up here. Diff grease, very nice. It's the Assault RC brand. Nice little refresh on some wheel nuts here. Got the RC Box Club logo on it there. This is kind of, ooh, it's got some noise to it. What do we got here? Whoa, what is this? Yeah, so we've got some posts here to put this together. It looks like it's gonna be like a tool stand because there's multiple little rows here to put your hex wrenches and wheel wrenches and stuff like that. Very nice. I'll have to put that together and maybe I'll show it to you at the end of the video. Nice, cool little sticker there, RC Yoda. Koozie, very nice, beachrc.com. Love it. Like that little graphic there, American flag. Oh, those are cool. Cool little sticker sheet, like that. Oh, nice. So this is really cool because this isn't all just uh, in-house branded stuff of one particular brand. I mean, this is literally a Trinity product. So it looks like we've got some Trinity bearing oil, a sensor wire, I don't know if you can see that, and then a sticker sheet, a little shipping list, little love note, and then signed by the beautiful man himself. Brent Densford, and then he does include a shirt. Right. Oh, very cool, I like that. It's a cool design, I like the colors. All in all, that's a pretty cool set of parts and such for our RC stuff. So RC Box Club is a monthly subscription service. All of the details are the first link down in the description below. You guys go check it out, see if you wanna get that thing coming to you fresh every month, keep your cars looking good, keep yourself looking good, and just, you know, have some fun with RC. So Brent, RC Box Club, thank you very much. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna be breaking down a setup sheet. Now, I'm hoping this video will help you guys kind of understand how I like to look at a setup sheet, and there's areas that I will look at first to determine certain things about the setup. We'll dive into this here in just a second, but before I do, I kinda of wanna open up with this very general statement that I hope we can all abide by. When we dive into a setup sheet, and we try to put a setup on our own cars. It's very important to understand that when these setups come from a factory driver, an R&D guy, the brand itself, etc., they've developed this setup to work together. Meaning, if you have the front end in there, but then not the rear end, well, that's not the same setup. A lot of times I'll get guys that will take a setup sheet that I give them and then I'll see them at the track and they'll say to me, Ryan, I put your setup in my car and it's doing something funky. It's not working or something, something, something. But then I look at it and yeah, they may have had the springs on the setup sheet, but then nothing else. So <laughs> to say they have my setup in their car, but it's not 100%, they really don't. 
Setups and preferences are gonna be subjective at the end of the day, I understand that. But if we're really trying to figure out if something works or doesn't, we need to do it to its fullest extent possible. Try to match everything 100%, 99 plus percent, so that then you can make a conclusive decision as to whether or not it's working. Enough gabbing, let's dive into a setup sheet and let's break it down, shall we? So the setup sheet that I have here is obviously for a TLR 22X4. So I'm gonna try and talk about this in generalities. And if there's something that's very unique to this car, I'll try to identify it. But most of the fundamental setup principles, data that we're gonna go over, apply to the majority of cars out there today. If you have a very specific question or something you're not sure about as I'm going through this and you're watching this, drop it down a comment below and I'll try to help you out further if I can. So the very first thing that we need to do is understand where was this setup used? Was it used at an indoor track, outdoor track, carpet, turf, etc.? So we can see here that I have this labeled as base indoor dirt setup. Now, sometimes I might have a particular track and I'll put that on there. Other times this is just like a general reference point, like in this case, and I try to identify it as such. Some setup sheets may have this detailed information, they may not, but I like to note the track conditions. So we can see that it was an indoor track. Clay, dirt, relatively smooth and hard packed. That's the general characteristic of the track. Grip level is important. You wanna see if that's identified on the setup sheet. Bite was medium to high. So a fair amount of grip. And we can see because on this particular setup sheet, the tread height on the tires, which is what we're gonna look at next, but we can see that the tread height was ghost or slicks. So fairly high bite. And that was the style of tire that we were using. Now, once we know where this was and the type of track, the very next thing I need to look at and identify is going to be the tires, which hopefully your setup sheet is going to have that information. In this case, we do. So we can see that we are using a raw speed tire and it's a bar style. The radar's in the rear and the stage two's up front. And even more importantly, we can see the compound that I was using which was a clay compound. This is important to note because, like I just said, 90% of your setup is going to come from your tires. If you have the wrong compound, you can almost rule out everything on this setup sheet is not gonna work because your tires are not correct. So get your tire compound, your tire selection, as close to right as possible before you look at any of this other information. Another thing I like to look at is were we doing anything special to the inserts? Uh, were they closed cell? Were they open cell? Most of the stuff out there is gonna be closed cell, but in this case, we can see that I was doing a V cut to the rear insert. Um, if you don't know what that is, very briefly, it's just removing a small amount of material out of the inside of the insert. I did a whole video on it. You could check it out over here, something, and get more information on it there. Okay, so we know where it was. We know what tires we were using and we know what we did to the tires. Now, uh, another big part of this, before we start looking at details of the setup information, as far as shocks and all that good stuff, I like to know, was this a spec class stock or was it modified? So in this case, you can see down here in the electronics section of the setup sheet, I had a Trinity X Factor 13.5. So that's a spec motor. It's gonna be in the spec class. Um, I think that modified vehicles are gonna demand a little bit more out of the mechanics of the vehicle, just because they have more power, they're gonna land harder, they're gonna jump further. So there's gonna be some stuff that may be different just based on that alone. May not, but it's worth noting before moving on. Okay, so now we know the general place that this is gonna race in, we know what class it's gonna race in. Now let's dive into the setup goodness. I like to see what they were doing for ride height because this is something that you adjust pretty easily and pretty often. As grip levels come up or the bumpiness of the track, it's a pretty quick, easy adjustment that you check throughout the day. So where are we starting? In this case, our ride height is going to be 18 millimeters. That's just the distance of the chassis to the ground. And if you don't know, that's just give the car a quick little couple compressions, 
drop it from about yay high, and then take your right hat gauge and slide it under and measure right under the points of like where the transmission, the diff cases are. And then that's how you get that measurement. It's measured front and rear. So right here we can see that this is the front section of the car and we had 18 millimeters of ride height. And then in the rear section, we can see that we had 18 millimeters of ride height back there as well. Now, probably the first big piece of information before I break down every little detail and everything else is gonna be that I like to look at is hub heights and diff heights, if it applies to your vehicle. In this case, we do have adjustable hub heights, so let's see what they are. For those of you that don't know, your hub height is going to be the relationship of your axle in line with the hinge on the arm. So this can either be raised or lowered and it will affect the vehicle. Typically speaking, when your hubs are low or your axle position is low, the car is going to roll a little bit more, potentially create a little bit more grip. but in higher speed, higher bike conditions, this is something that may cause the vehicle to flip easily. So it's a pretty big determining factor to the overall setup and handling of the vehicle. So we wanna see what it is. Up front, we can see that this has a caster hat adjustment system. Um, this may be different depending on your vehicle. I know that the TLR two wheel drive just uses washers and its adjustment is a little bit different from a four wheel, but nonetheless, we can see that it's indicated right here and we're right in the middle. So 1.7, so this hub height is right smack dab in the middle. Nothing too high, nothing too low. And then in the rear, this has an adjustable hub height system where there's an insert at the bottom of the hub, and this will dictate the height of your axle in relation to the arm. So again, we can see it's right smack dab in the middle. This is gonna vary depending on the vehicle, depending on track, etc. but that's the general concept. Okay, so now that we have a firm grasp on things that are telling me about how much grip, how fast this track was, let's look at the shock package, shall we? So if we come down here to the shock section, first thing we're gonna look at is how much support and kind of like how fast were these shocks moving? Right off the bat, at the top, we can see that we had 42 and a half weight oil in the front and 37 and a half weight oil in the rear. That's just the fluid inside the shock. The higher this number, the slower the shock is gonna move. The lower this number, the faster it will move, the thinner the fluid will be. So anything closer to zero is gonna be like water, whereas something closer to you know 100 or above is gonna start to feel like grease rather than oil because it's so thick. It's worth noting that if you are trying to compare an associated setup to a TLR setup or vice versa or some other brand, and you're using an oil that's not like what's specified here, if you try to compare a TLR 42 and a half to an AE 42 and a half, I know those are not the same. Uh, they're almost a full step different. Uh, TLR oils tend to be a little bit thinner than AE. so. Just knowing that when you go into it is worth understanding. So that if you're trying to get something the same as me, but you're not using the same stuff, it may not end up being the same result. Hopefully that makes sense. So the next thing I like to look at after that would be what's the piston inside of the shock body. In this case, we could see that this, I know these are the kit pistons. One six holes up front, 1.7s in the rear. Pretty standard stuff. Um, Depending on your vehicle or brand, you may have some really cool options as far as tuning goes. And pay attention to the type of piston it is, not just the whole size. So there's machine pistons, there's kit pistons, there's beveled pistons, there's all kinds of stuff out there and see if it's indicated on the particular setup so that you can make sure you have matching or the same thing. Uh, next that we can work our way down is seeing the stroke. So the stroke is just when you lift the vehicle off the ground, how far can that shock travel? It's simply the measurement from the bottom of the shock body right here to the top of the eyelet. The distance between is your stroke. Having more or less is going to affect your vehicle and it's going to be indicated there as stroke. 
Some setup sheets may call it droop, like on your eight scale stuff, but that's what we're working with right there. Another thing to note is eyelets may have some variable lengths. So that's actually the eyelet itself. It may be longer or shorter. So that would affect the overall droop of the shock and distance that the wheels can travel downward. Just make sure that you understand that yours are matching or if they're different, what are they? See if it's on the setup sheet. And lastly, and importantly, is what kind of spring do you have? Probably the biggest thing that people need to understand is that there's a lot of different brands out there and no one uses the same system. <laughs> Meaning if it is a Kyosho gold or white and then you try, and then you try to use a TLR white, they're gonna be completely different. It's not the same at all. So if you're new to this, just know that every brand, just think of it as it's their own unique proprietary identification system. And then even within brands, they can have different types of springs, but still use the same coloring system. And then those springs are different. For example, if you used an AE blue, I'm gonna ask you, well, is it a V1 or a V2? Because one is progressive and one is linear and they're very different. As we can see on the setup sheet here, it is indicated that I tried to say the brand, the type of spring and the rate. So it's important to understand all three of those things so that you can make sure that you have all the information and it's matching as it applies to you. Okay, so we know the track, we know the conditions, we know the tires, we know the class, we know the suspension package that we had, we know the hub heights, the axle heights, the ride height. Next, I like to move on to, from the shocks, let's look at the position that they're mounted on on the vehicle. So we can see that this setup sheet has a tower illustration and the arm illustration, and they have holes. And it may be identified this way on your setup sheet, it may not, but hopefully this information is on there. Pretty much every car that I can think of has multiple hole locations in these areas. So in here we can see that the black dot is indicating that it's on the outside hole at the top on the front tower. And then the shock eyelet, the bottom of the shock is mounted on the inside hole on the arm. Maybe very different on your vehicle, depending on the brand, depending on the track, but make sure that you understand that you know where these locations are because they have a pretty big effect on the vehicle. And then in the rear, same thing. We had it on the outside at the top and inside hole on the bottom. Just make sure that you know what you have and what the setup sheet is telling you. Okay, next up, let's go ahead and work our way through camber link positions and spacing as it applies to your vehicle. Every car is gonna be a little bit different as far as the holes that may be available or the way that these things are adjusted, but most cars are going to have these camber links and some adjustments for them. In the case of the 22X4, we can see that we have a mount location on the shock tower and it can either be up or down. And in this case, the front is in the bottom location and then the outside is mounted on the hub. We don't have multiple holes there. We just have a height adjustment and we can see that this says zero millimeters. So that's how we read that information there. Important to understand it and know what we have. Rear link locations, same thing holes on the tower, up or down, and then locations on the caster hat out here on the hub. This is interesting that this has three holes like this. Um, pretty much every car has a different, you might have four holes, you might have five holes, you might have one, and the spacing and the way that you adjust these things may be different, but again, just make sure that you find it on the setup sheet and just see how's the front camber link mounted, where is it mounted, how's it spaced, Where's the rear link mounted? How's it spaced? So now we got the details on the suspension. We know where the camber links are, how they're spaced. Now let's look at the hinge pin locations. Now, if this is a two wheel drive buggy, particularly a TLR, you're not gonna have an adjustment up front, but this is the four wheel buggy and most four wheel buggies have the adjustments front and rear. So it's simply this pill system that's adjustable. And what it does is it just moves the hinge pin up or down, in or out, and it has a pretty big effect on the vehicle. So again, like we've been saying, 
Just make sure that you know what's in your vehicle and what the setup sheet is telling you. Do you need to take the pills out? Do you need to adjust them? Let's take a look. So we can see that the A block is going to be the front furthest hinge pin brace is in a upward position about in the middle. And then the B block, which is right behind it on the front bulkhead is in the center area, just a little bit down. So we have a little bit of anti-squat there, but everything's in the middle. If we move to the back of the vehicle, the C block is gonna be the one that's in front of the rear bulkhead. It's in the middle position, a little bit downward. And then the D block, which is at the furthest end of the vehicle, is in the same location. So there we see where all of our pill inserts are located. Um, the adjustment system may be a little bit different on your vehicle or the degrees that you can do these things, it may change depending on your brand, but see if your vehicle has this adjustment. What is it? How does it apply? Now, this is going to be very subjective to your particular vehicle or track needs or driver preference. But another thing that's worth noting is, are there any adjustments or spacing on the steering assembly? What I mean specifically is a lot of times you're going to have a steering arm or steering plate on the outside of the vehicle up front. And those can come in varying lengths or angles and things that will affect scrub radius or just the amount that the car is going to steer initially versus at the end of the stroke. It's hard for me to speak on this in a general sense because I know that there's a lot of different options out there depending on brand. But what I can say is if your setup sheet is indicating these things, make sure that you understand what they are. So that way you know what adjustments you're making or if you're talking to someone else and they're giving you setup information. It's important to understand, oh, do you have the short steering arm or plate or do you have the long one? as they're talking about how their car has no steering or tons of steering. Knowing these things is going to help you expedite how quickly you can problem solve when it comes to your own setup challenges. Plates or parts that are interchangeable, there's also gonna be spacing under the ball studs and links, etc. So just make sure you take a look at it, match it up. Another thing that may be pretty subjective to your vehicle or the application of that vehicle is going to be a sway bar system. Does it have it or does it not have it? If it does, which sway bar is it? Um, they may be identified like here in the TLR setup sheet for this particular vehicle. We can see that the sway bars are identified by thickness, which is pretty nice because that's easy to understand. Some systems out there may be identified by color. So it could be white, blue, green, brown, whatever. Um, I don't like those as much because it's a little bit harder to understand, well, is green thicker or is brown? I don't know. I'd have to measure it with some calipers, which you could do that and it's pretty easy to figure out. But see if it's in there. Which one is it? Is it thicker? Is it thinner than mine? Which way should I go? Okay, next up that's gonna be pretty important is on the inside of the vehicle, literally, is going to be particularly with four-wheel drive vehicles that have fluid diffs I like to look at what fluid should we be using or where am I at? Now, hopefully you've replaced your fluid within the past recent history, because if you didn't, um, this stuff breaks down over time, especially in four wheel drive vehicles. In this particular car, I know that I have 10K up front and 7K in the rear, which is kind of like we were talking about shock oils. It's just a thickness. The lower the number, the thinner the oil. The higher the number, the thicker the oil. And it changes the literal differential action. And it has a big effect as to how the car will enter corners, go through corners, exit corners. And sometimes it's a driver preference. Sometimes it's track application. You just want to make sure that you know what you have and what the setup sheet is telling you. And ultimately, most importantly, make sure it's fresh. If you are watching this and you have a vehicle that's rear wheel drive and it just has something like a ball diff, I would make sure that you know that that diff is fresh and that it's not really crunchy feeling. And then if it's noted about the tightness of the diff, whether it's loose, tight, normal, try to use those as a gauge as to what yours is and what the setup sheet is telling you. 
If you need help on that one, the easiest thing to do is to just ask one of the local fast guys at your track, hey, does my diff feel good? Yes? No? Is it tight? Is it loose? And then maybe they can help you dial that one in because that one's a little bit more of a feel thing, a little bit harder to explain. Another thing to look at is going to be, is there any weight bias that we've added to the vehicle? Um, some setup sheets are gonna have some spots for it, some don't. Um, here we can see that one of them that we have on this particular setup sheet is a check mark for the carbon plate underneath the electronics. You could uncheck that and then technically indicate that you're not running any weight there. Um, other setup sheets, like I know the two wheel drive setup sheet has some spots where it indicates if you're running any weight under the rear transmission, if the C-block is brass or aluminum. Um, just make sure that you look over the areas that identify these things so that you know if they are running an extra 30 grams of weight in the vehicle or not. It's pretty important, has a pretty big effect on the vehicle. A lot of cars these days are going to have different types of materials when it comes to the arms or the side rails or the towers or maybe some other areas depending on your vehicle. But on this particular setup sheet, we can see that we have the standard type of arms and the stiffazel. So that's kind of as it sounds, the standards are not as stiff as the alternative and that's going to have a little bit of a handling effect on the vehicle. So I know on the AE cars, you have hard arms and normal arms and soft arms. And then I think that there's also like on A scale cars, you're gonna have inserts that you can put in the arms to make them even stiffer. So just make sure that you look at that stuff, see what's there, see what's on your car. Does it match, is it different? You get the deal. Probably the last bit that I'll go over is going to be the electronics area. Um, we already went over the fact that is it a spec motor, is it a mod motor? But as far as the other stuff goes, all setup sheets are gonna be a little bit different. But if there's an area where they identify some of the things like timing and throttle profiles, this can tell you if they're doing any tuning in that area. Um, timing on the motor, good information. Uh, gearing, pretty important to see. That's gonna be possibly subject to the track. Uh, for example, if the track that you go to has a big triple right out of a corner, I might have to gear down for that because the time difference in making that versus not is a second versus if I geared up and I double singled and then that's half a second slower, you get the point. It's very subjective, but worth a note, use it as a starting point, but definitely dial it in for your particular track. Well, and there you have it going through a rundown of a setup sheet for at least a 22X4. Hopefully that information was generalized enough that you can use it if you're reading a setup sheet that is not this particular vehicle. If you have any questions and I didn't go over a detail that is on a setup sheet that you see, drop a comment down below and I might be able to help out or if somebody else who's familiar with that platform sees that comment, jump on in there, help them out so that we can get them all dialed in with the right setup at their particular track. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, hopefully this was helpful to some of you out there or somebody who's just getting into RC. Um, definitely like the video, comment, subscribe, stick around. We'll go on some race day adventures and more tutorials here in the near future. Um, thanks again to RC Box Club for sending me that cool subscription box. You guys can check it out. It's the first link down in the description. And that's all I got for you today. Thanks for sticking around. See you guys in the next one. Peace. Around the corner, I thought I'd seen you. Thought you were looking for me. I thought I'd reached you. I belong in some other.